morning. Good morning. I'm delighted to welcome you to the 2021 I2E2 Jesuit event. Uh, I'm Sarah Lynn Baird. I am Dean of the College of Arts, Sciences, and Engineering. And I'm actually a musician myself. Choral conducting was my career, so I identify very strongly with the School of the Arts and the programs that they do, as well as with the Center for Social Inclusion. I am pleased to introduce to you the two co-sponsors for this event, Dr. Megan Merciers, Executive Director of the School of the Arts, formerly the Music Department Chair and Associate Professor in Music, and Dr. Andrea Hunt, Director of the Mitchell West Center for Social Inclusion, a Special Assistant to the Vice President in the Office of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion, and an Associate Professor of Sociology in the Department of Psychology and Sociology. SOTA and the Center, as embodied by Drs. Mercier's and Hunt, are deeply committed to promoting equity and inclusion in the arts at the university and in the community, supporting the strategic goals of both the college and the university. Indeed, the missions of these entities, the school and the center, describe their commitments to these goals. The Mitchell West Center for Social Inclusion states in its mission, with the aim of advancing the common good, the Mitchell West Center for Social Inclusion at the University of North Alabama, the only one in the state, will support education, research, community, and advocacy by working with diverse groups on campus, in the shoals, and across the state and region. The center welcomes everyone by providing an accessible and inclusive space for students and faculty to share knowledge, collaborate on interdisciplinary projects, and build sustainable partnerships with organizations that are committed to addressing some of the most pressing social problems we face today. The UNA School of the Arts, within the College of Arts, Sciences, and Engineering, promotes the artistic enrichment of the campus and surrounding communities by facilitating student expression and creativity through studies in cinematic arts, culinary arts management, fashion merchandising and design, hospitality and events management, interior architecture and design, music, theater, and the visual arts. SOTA cultivates a diverse, collaborative, and inclusive environment while advocating for equity in arts education. Both of these groups support and encourage the development of new initiatives and entrepreneurial spirit, collaborative activities, advocacy for their mission, and most importantly, demonstrate acceptance of and openness to everyone and every idea. As a musician, I deeply appreciate their efforts and collaborations to promote not only the arts, but also the specific ideals of complete equity and inclusion in all of our activities and educational I'm very pleased to welcome each of you and uh, look forward to the events of this morning.
going to introduce our speaker for this morning, and there is a lot to say about Joshua Burford, but I'm going to keep it short so we can get to the learning part of this and why we're here. Um, so Joshua Burford is an award-winning historian, archivist, and educator with over 20 years of experience creating stronger communities for queer and transgender people across the U.S. He is perhaps best known for his work to preserve and make accessible the queer history of the American South through the development of archival collections and oral histories. Josh is a nationally recognized educator and trainer who has worked with K-12 schools, colleges and universities, corporations, and nonprofits to bring greater knowledge about the ways each of us can be more inclusive of diverse identities engage in self-evaluation about best practices, and create pathways for increased retention of minority individuals. Um, so we are thrilled to have Josh with us today um, for our opening talk, and then later this today for our keynote um, at lunch. So without further ado, Joshua Burford. Hi everybody, it's so exciting to be here this morning. This is the first time I have spoken face to face with humans since before we went into the quarantine lockdown, so it's nice to feel back in my element. Um, I always want to start all of my talks by saying this. Uh, first, my pronouns are he, him, and his. Um, I identify as a queer southerner. I grew up in Alabama, uh, in, a, in Anniston. For those of you who don't know, Anniston is here. Um, it's almost Georgia, basically. Um, I prefer a more direct conversational style when I'm talking to people. I like to think as a, both a radical and an anti-capitalist that the difference between us and this space has nothing to do with how important I am, but more about where I'm standing behind the podium. And so I would prefer for us to share information today as opposed to me lecturing you. Um, I mean, I got a lot of crap in my head that we're gonna talk about, certainly. So don't get me wrong, there's plenty to talk about. But, for my first talk since the pandemic, what I wanted to do was to talk about language. Um, you know, the, the queer community has a very interesting relationship with language. We're going to talk this morning historically about how we went from a community that was basically a medical diagnosis uh, to an alphabet soup with a ton of different identities in it. And I'd like to say before we start, I'm a huge fan of more language in the community. Like, I'd be happy if you were a subset of like you just picked a word and that's the word that you are, we're gonna throw a letter in the alphabet too to keep it rolling. Because for a very long time, we were not allowed to talk about ourselves, especially not openly in public. And so the idea of having access to language historically means that we come from a long tradition of people who were able to self-identify within very different kinds of political, cultural, and in a lot of cases, uh, spiritual movements. And so this morning, I, what I want to do is I want to give you a little historical journey. We're going to start, and don't make a face when I say this, but we're going to start in the 1860s, brace yourselves, and we're going to, I promise we won't stay there for too long. But I want to give you a sense of how we got to where we are today. Everything that we're going to talk about this morning, when we talk about what these words mean, quote unquote, I'm, I'm talking about what they meant at the moment. Almost everything has changed. And so at the end, I hope that we can have a conversation between us about it. So, Here's the thing, like it's it's funny to me that it's funny to me as a community that we're always looking for something like really old to hang our hat on, right? I love those conversations that people have about, well, you know, like in ancient Rome, there were lots of gay people. And I'm always like, oh, I'm not really sure that means what you think it means. Like, I mean, sure. Have there been people engaged in same-sex behavior? Absolutely. But it really wasn't until the 19th century that we had the opportunity to develop solid identifiable communities. This does not mean that people weren't doing all kinds of things. It just means that what it meant to be gay or queer was so predicated on the time period that it was in. For a long time, you know, homosexuality was illegal just about everywhere. And so when you were, your identity was based on like a particular activity. So people weren't gay because they were self-identifying as gay, they were gay because they got caught and there was a lot of legal ramifications for what it meant to be gay. That's the reason why so many of the original words that were used to describe us are not very great. Can you guys handle a little like blue language this morning? I'm always a little bit weirded out about saying these kind of words, so brace yourselves. Um, when we got called sodomites, 
at the beginning, right? This very out of context, by the way, reference to Sodom and Gomorrah. Sidebar, that is not what that story was about. Um, in fact, that story was not about gay people until like the 1600s. So I'm not, you know, the greatest with ancient history, but that was more than a day after Sodom and Gomorrah happened a lot later. So we got called Sodomites because sodomy was considered, you know, like gross, right? It was like, ooh, I can't believe people would do that to each other. That is so gross. And so catamite is probably my favorite. Catamite is a word that has almost completely vanished. But catamites were people who allowed themselves on purpose to engage in sodomy, which is my favorite thing. Somehow, like, sodomy was accidental. It's like, oh, you know, just kidding. Like, you know, I was just in this bush, and this thing happened. But catamites were doing it on purpose. Um, and then brace yourself for this, but like the, the word that is the most often attached to us is the word faggot. And what's so interesting about that word is that it's never really changed its meaning, right? People always say that like fags are like bundles of sticks, right? Which is true. The, the part they missed though is that it was bundles of sticks that were used to burn heretics. And so like that word was a, it wasn't just that that word was supposed to be offensive. It was also supposed to be violent, right? So when you recall that word, Violence happened after. So like to be called a sodomite didn't necessarily mean someone was going to hurt you. And so at the beginning of our words, all we really had were things people were yelling at us or calling us or accusing us of. And so when we finally have an opportunity to have language, the first thing we did was start to organize. Because how could we not? I mean, you can't live your life in complete invisibility and not want to see other people like yourself. And so we got access to words, now granted, not words we were necessarily choosing, but words that at least gave us a sense of what it was like to be ourselves. And so in 1869, German scientists coined the word homosexual, and I'm giving it to you in English because I can't say the German version of this word, because I took French in college, and so German is not a thing for me. But here's the thing about homosexuals. Um, homosexuality was a diagnosis. Like, there were no homosexual people. Like, that wasn't a thing that you self-identified as. It was a way of describing your behavior. Mostly aberrant at the time. But the thing about this is that the attempt to create a word to discuss us didn't come from a crappy place. Like, people were actually trying to figure out who we were. The thing is, if it, had, if it wasn't natural, if it wasn't normal, then why do people keep doing it? Because I guarantee you the consequence for engaging in homosexual behavior was pretty high. And so they thought to themselves, okay, if we could just figure out where this is coming from, then maybe we can figure out why these people are but it was not an identity. Um, in fact, homosexual as a word is like, it feels so antiquated. Like I never say this word unless I'm doing a talk about queer history. Because nowadays when anyone says homosexual to me, all I can think of are those people that are picketing on pride festivals. You know, where the big signs are like, homosexuals. And I'm like, oh, that's cute. Like, that's not a thing, but I mean, you're cute for thinking that's a thing. Um, what I also like to point out is that homosexual as a word was coined in 1869 and heterosexual wasn't coined until 1890s. So well, I'm not saying we came first, I'm just saying the historical <laughs> record speaks for itself. But I just love the idea that one day they had a word for gay people and someone was like, oh wait, what about those other people? Oh, right. Yeah, yeah, we should probably have a word for them too. So these two words together give us a sense of, okay, so wait, what you're telling me is there is a quantifiable group of behaviors. If that is the case, then what we can do is find other people with those behaviors and then we will all come together in a way that allows us to have community. And so this idea of who we could become was just like, it was right on the tip of our tongue. But this wasn't us. This was a medical community, right? We just adopted it. I'm gonna show you the Kenzie scale because I think it's important to look at what it means for us to try to describe Ourselves. The Kenzie scale, for those of you who don't know, was developed in the 1950s by Alfred Kenzie. Kenzie was trying to, at the very least, get people options for sexual behavior. Now, you know, you can have all the feelings you want to about like his, his studies and how in depth they were, but the truth is, what he proved was that given the opportunity to self-identify, there was a lot more gray area than just gay people and straight people. And when people had the opportunity to self-identify anonymously, even more. And so the thing about the Kenzie scale is that when it came out, first of all, it freaked people out. Because Kenzie came up with that 10% rule, right? Like 10% of the population was engaging in same-sex behavior. And everyone who was gay went, yeah, that makes sense. And then everyone who was straight went, oh wait, that's a lot more than I thought. <laughs> we thought there was like 20 of them. No, 10%. 
Nowadays, they're saying, by the way, it's 25% of the population identifies as something other than heterosexual, which, again, you know, if the gay agenda was a thing, we're doing pretty well. Um, but what I love about the Kenzie scale is it gives you so much room to maneuver. My favorite thing on the Kenzie scale, so if zero is exclusively straight, and six is exclusively gay, and three is what we would consider bisexual, although this is not very nuanced for bisexuality. It's just sort of like midpoint three, right? But I mean, look at this. Like, number four is my favorite. Predominantly homosexual, but more than incidentally. But this is my favorite thing. It's like, incidentally, it's like this one time in camp, right? But like, more than incidentally, it's like, it was a Thursday and I had an idea. Do you know what I mean? Like, I was engaged. Not every day, but like, you know, like, we might have been doing some stuff. And I, I think about my own life. I was, in, I was introduced to the Kenzie scale at 19. And at the time, I was fresh out of the closet. Like, I had been out for like three and a half weeks. You know, I had asymmetrical hair. I was wearing orange nail polish. I was pissed off. You know what I mean? And when I went in the world, I was like, I'm a Kenzie six. You know what? This is me. Fully gay. Right? That seems so long ago. And then thinking about my own life coming out as queer later, realizing that gay was not what I was because it didn't fit for me, realizing that now I am definitely more like a four and a half. Kenzie four and a half these days. But that had everything to do with my life and having experiences of realizing what it meant to be queer. My favorite thing about Kenzie is that about seven or eight years ago, a graduate student at the University of Indiana went back through the Kenzie data, and what they discovered was in the margins of the work were these little X's. And what they discovered was even back in the 50s, there were people identifying as asexual. And so the ACE community has what they call the Kenzie X's now, which is all this data about people, again, without access to this word, identifying as part of the ACE community, which I think is really fantastic. It says everything that we need to know about who people are and what does it mean to have language. Because back then, asexual was not an option, but here they still are. And so the Kenzie scale, I, I mean, I just love it because it, it really does give people an opportunity to kind of be like, I mean, where am I in this whole scenario? So, we're going to start with gay. We're going to start with gay for lots of reasons. We're going to, we're going to start with gay because, one, it's our first real attempt at self-description. So in the 1920s in the, Chicago, in the Chicago Tribune, there's an article that says a group of gay men were discovered working together on an event. And so that was the first time gay had ever been put in print in a way that identified this as a group of people with an identity. We had been using gay for a long time to talk about ourselves, and this is why gay is so important. And this is why this is called gay isn't happy. So gay was the first time that we as a group of people found a word that allowed us to talk to one another, but in full view of a large heterosexual community. Because gay, up until the 1920s, when we started calling ourselves gay, meant happy, right? Gay, that's why it's in all the Christmas songs. Every year at Christmas, I'm like, Christmas is so gay, y'all it's in all the carols or whatever, and it makes those people uncomfortable, right? The people that don't drink out of Starbucks cups because they don't have Jesus on it or whatever. And so we started calling ourselves gay because it was a way for us to identify our own world and talk to each other openly, but without straight people understanding what we were doing. And so if I were to walk up to you and say, hey, I'm going to this real gay party later, we as queer people heard queer party. There'll be other gay people like us. Straight people heard happy fun day party. And so they'd be like, I'd love to go to a gay party. And we would just laugh at them behind their backs. Like, they have no idea what we're talking about. And so gay was an intercommunity word. It allowed us the opportunity to speak openly. But the other thing was, gay was how we felt about ourselves when we were together. In every way that matters, gay is the opposite of homosexual. Because homosexuals were sad, they were broken, they were in treatment. They were trying to fix a problem. Gay people were not. Gay people were happy about being together, about building a community. It's why in 1923, Henry Gerber starts the Society for Human Rights when he found out there were other gay people in his neighborhood. And so gay isn't chosen randomly. Gay is chosen because it describes how we felt about our world and our universe, not how other people were describing us. And so gay is so important. Now, gay has a lot of it has a lot to make up for, because for a long time we were all just gay. Everybody was gay. Trans people were gay, we were gay, lesbians were gay, everybody was gay. But gay was how we wanted to be seen in the community and how we saw ourselves. And that cannot be underscored. 
And so I love thinking about what it meant for us as a group of people to finally get our feet in the water and say, you know what, we're not unhappy about this. We're actually quite happy. Um, one of the things we found recently, which I'm going to talk about in my talk at noon, is that we have the oldest thing in the IHP collections is from 1912. Um, it is a diary that was written by a gay man from Jefferson County that he wrote in from 1912 until 1950. And he it only uses gay to describe himself after the, the war, after the 40s were over. But in it, he, he doesn't talk about being a homosexual. He talks about what it meant to be, there's this poem that he wrote about seeing his lover at a party that they went to across the room from each other and how his heart was jumping at the idea that they were together. And so, it, it runs so counter to this narrative that the community was like fully sad and broken. Because we, I mean, we had a lot of issues to deal with, but we thought much better about ourselves than other people gave us credit for. Lesbian is such an interesting thing to talk about because in the community, we've been using lesbian on and off probably since the 1930s or 40s, but it didn't really have the, came, the same kind of like punch that gay did. We were all gay men and women for a very long time. But lesbian is so important because it was the first time really within the community that we started to have to talk about the diversity of our own community's experience. Because at the end of the 1960s, when radical gay activism was happening and starting to really get its feet after Stonewall, what happened was in rooms like this, when we were organizing ourselves, women were going, we need to be at the table. But they were being talked over by gay men, they were being ignored. And finally, a group of women said, you know what? We appreciate that we're working on this together but you have to understand that we are not the same people. And so what I'm fond of saying is, although gay and lesbian people get lumped into the same categories all the time, there are no two people in the world who have less in common than gay men and lesbians. We're just in it together because that's what happened. But lesbian women finally had to say, look y'all, look, we can't, even, we can't even get the same pay at work. Like, we're not talking about the same things every single day. And so lesbian was really important, not to separate them from the gay community, but to give them more space within the gay community so that we could talk about their experiences. And so it's important, I mean, what I love about lesbian is that the idea of choosing an identity, let's find the most obscure reference we can find, <laughs> um, and then we're gonna make that obscure reference work for us. And so when we're talking about lesbian, right, we're talking about the Isle of Lesbos, we're talking about Sappho. I mean, I just love a deep dive. It's like, let's find the most obscure ancient Greek reference we can find and hang a word done, lesbian. And so what's really funny to me is this notion that, that, somehow, that somehow we all had to have the same identity, and we didn't. I mean, the community itself is very diverse. We have people of color, we have different religions, we have different geographies, we have very different class structures in the queer community. And so lesbian was really the first opportunity for people to go, nope, that's not working the way you think it is. We're gonna have to do something different. By the way, happy Bisexual Awareness Day, which was yesterday. I mean, we can still talk nice about bisexuals today if you want to. I mean, I'm, I'm a fan, so. But there probably isn't an older word than bisexual. I mean, the truth is, we've been talking in some regard about bisexuality for probably since Shakespeare started writing all of his bisexual plays. But the thing about bisexuality, and the reason I'm putting it in this context, is because the bi community had existed sort of as the silent minority even within the gay community. The thing is, back at the beginning of trying to build a community, we looked at how we were gonna organize. And in the 1950s, it was decided that we would use a minority model to talk about gay people. That was the thing that made the most sense. The people who were organizing the gay community said, we're watching civil rights happen. The civil rights movement is making a case for identity as a minority, we'll do the same thing. Now, it wasn't a perfect fit in any way that made sense because so many white people were gay. <laughs> and so you're gonna have a real hard time making a minority argument when your leadership is all white. But the minority model at least gave people the opportunity to see gay people as like a subset. Within that subset, bisexuality got pushed to the bottom because the idea was, now follow me here, and this might sound just a teeny bit biphobic, but it's not coming from me, it's history, so I apologize in advance. But the idea was we had to be so different from straight people and so fixed in our identities that there would be no way for them to critique us. And so we had to be gay men and lesbian women with no middle ground if we were gonna gain the rights that we were looking for. Now, this doesn't work for bi people. And so bisexuals got pushed down a layer even within the community
because it wasn't really, it wasn't a thing people were ready to unpack. Bi people had been organizing themselves for quite a long time. And so in the early part of the 1990s, there was this push from the bi community to be included. Like, we're not going to stay the silent minority within this community anymore. We need to have our own visibility. And so between, what you see happening is a lot of like gay and lesbian alliances are happening all over the place. And, uh, Deep South Mississippi in the 70s, in Alabama in the early 1980s, in Georgia between 67 and 75, gay and lesbian alliances. In the early part of the 1990s, bi people started to advocate for themselves so hard that what you see is a language change. At UA, when I was in my undergraduate, they had been gay and lesbian student services on campus forever. And then in 1993, they became the GLBA, Gay, Lesbian, Bisexual Alliance. That did not happen by accident. That happened because bi students organized themselves and said, we'll come, but we'll only come as bi people. We're not going to become anything else. Bisexuality also is a dilemma for a lot of people because you can't really see it in the same way, right? Like, you, you guys know what gaydar is? You've heard the, the idea of gaydar? By the way, gaydar's not a thing. Like, that's just ridiculous. There's no such thing as gaydar. But we have this idea that if like, we look close enough, if we just spend a little time like unpacking people, we're like, oh wait, he got gay shoulders, right? Or he, I mean, for me, it's my hands. My hands are super gay. Um, I do this a lot. But there's no way, like, so no one has ever walked into a room and said, oh, God, did you see so-and-so today? So bisexual. Because we had no conceptualization for what bisexual looked like. All we could do is defer to the partner. And so if you're holding hands with a boy and you were a boy, you were gay. And if you're a woman and hold hands with a woman, you're a lesbian. And so bi people had to fight tooth and nail just to get the recognition they needed within the gay community. And hold for surprise, face probably the most biphobia from gay people than they do from straight people, which sucks, and yet is the reality for a lot of people who are bisexual. And so while bi is a very old idea, and it is a sexual orientation that has been around in history and literature and music forever, bi people still to this day are fighting a fight for visibility, which is difficult. Now, the best thing that happened to us is young people. Because the younger generations, the, the millennials and the Zers, have a much more fluid feeling about sexual orientation. It doesn't have to be a fixed identity as much as my generation did, even in the 90s. And so the addition of pansexuality, which by the way, this was almost omnisexuality, which I love. Something about omnisexuality just sounds like a little bit more dirty to me, <laughs> which I'm a huge fan of. Do you know what I mean? Like you walk into a room, you're like, oh, I am omnisexual. People are like, oh. <laughs> well, that's interesting. You know, let's sit with them at the dinner table. But we settle on pan. But again, pansexuality is not that different in the sense of how it's applied. It's just in a world where gender identities are finally being allowed the multiplicity that was already existing, bisexuality wasn't enough. It just wasn't. And so we needed more language to discuss what it meant when you said, you know, this is my partner and their age gender. You needed more language for that. And so pansexuality is this, what I like to think of as an evolution of accessibility. Pan does not replace bisexuality, and the, identi the identities of bi people still exist and are valid. It's just, one is doing this. It's like opening up so that you have more room to maneuver. You know, I will say, and I probably should have said this at the beginning, the thing that I think is that we're, the greatest disservice that we're doing to young people of all types, straight and queer and trans, is having them settle on a word for an identity too soon. Like, I would rather someone spend their entire 20s kicking all the tires and trying out all the language before they can settle on something that makes sense. Because I guarantee you, when I came out as queer when I was in my late 20s, people were shocked. I mean, and I don't know which part they were the most shocked about, because queer for me is, it means a lot of things, but I didn't feel comfortable identifying as anything but gay, except I was totally bad at it. Like all the things I was supposed to do and like as a gay dude, I didn't. And so every, I just kind of wore that identity around for way too long. I mean, I'm great at being queer, but I was terrible at being gay. Still am. Don't like anything I'm supposed to like. And so this kind of identity development is so important because it allows us to, to get at that thing, that, that nucleus, right, of what it means to be. I'm not really entirely sure why transgender as an umbrella term is so 
difficult for people. But let me give you a little bit of a background on this. So have you all heard of Virginia Prince? So Virginia Prince is kind of like your problematic aunt who says things at Thanksgiving. And you're like sitting across the table and they say, I mean, I would have gotten that vaccination, but I'm, you know, I'm not sure that the, this is a real thing for COVID. And you're like, oh my Lord, what are you talking about? Get your shot, auntie, like figure it out. But Virginia Prince coined this term in the 1960s, the term transgender. When she coined it as a trans activist in the 60s, what she actually meant for its original usage was more what we would consider now gender queer. Because Virginia Prince was an activist who said that identity was based on the individual human being. It had nothing to do with the body. And so Virginia Prince was a firm believer that no body modifications had to happen on the bodies of trans people. If you liked your body and it worked the way that it was supposed to, you didn't have to fix it. Fix it. And so this idea of gender fluidity is introduced right at the very beginning. Here's the problem with your problematic aunt. In an effort to, to try to make room for more gender fluidity, Virginia Prince said a lot of really shitty things about transsexual people who were taking hormones and were altering their bodies. And so there was a lot of infighting in the community very early about what this work could mean. When we as a group of people decided to use trans as the umbrella category, what we meant was transgressive, like transgender was transgressive. It was people who were pushing back against the notion of a fixed binary. And so that there was room to maneuver because we had seen it. We saw what it looked like. The problem, again, was that trans people, trans people by their very identity, don't have and cannot have the same access in our culture that cis people do. Because the system is built for the binary. Men are X, women are X. Gay men are X, lesbian women are X. And so trans people by their very identity call into question the fixed nature of the binary. They just do. Just by being humans and alive, they're like, nope, that's not how that works. And so trans people had the most difficulty getting into conversations with the regular community. But this is why there are so many trans people in leadership positions. This is why that the Stonewall riots were not a group of white cis gay men who were living in fancy places in New York. It was, it was trans and queer people of color. They were young. I mean, Sylvia Rivera was like 17 at the Stonewall riots. It was young trans people of color who were at the Cooper's Donut Shop Rats in LA, who were at Compton's Cafeteria in San Francisco in the 60s. It's because they had been forced to the margins, all, I mean literally all the way to the end of the margin. They had the most at stake to fight. And so there's so much trans leadership at the beginning. If you haven't watched it, when we're done today, go to the YouTubes, type in Sylvia Rivera gay, uh, gay pride speech. And what you can watch is a recovered video that was done by a historian a few years ago of Sylvia Rivera um, addressing a crowd in New York at the, I think it's the 73 Pride Festival. And she's standing up there saying, my body has been beaten and pushed and forced into the margins so that you could be here today. So don't tell me I don't belong. I mean, that's radical trans activism from the jump. And yet, we push them and push them and push them. So what happens in the 2000s is that um, and you know what, I'm just going to give you the, give you my version of this, because there are groups I don't care for. But um, in 1998, uh, during a rebranding, the Human Rights Campaign created a new flyer about the community and added a section about the trans community. And it was not great. And I mean, the language was problematic, all caps as hell. And a group of trans activists got a hold of it and went, it was like, hey, I'm sorry, who wrote this? because uh, this is crap. And so in the late 2000s, the trans community, also with the birth of the internet, there's a group called Trans Queer Nation that was being built in chat rooms online. That group finally got enough, they got pissed off enough in the late 90s, early 2000s that T gets added to the LGBT suit because trans actors were like, if you're gonna talk about us, not without us. And so all of a sudden, now we've got trans people at the table because they pushed their way to the table. And so again, it didn't happen by accident. It happened because people were, were pushing so hard for it. And so trans identity is, again, it's multifaceted. This is certainly not everything. I just picked a few things just so you can see. But what's, what's really important now is that there is finally reaching an equilibrium between transsexual people who are in the process of some kind of physical 
modification that allows them to present to the world an existent flesh body that makes them the most comfortable. And then an entire generation of people who are not looking to make any physical alterations, but to be seen as who they actually are. There is there is an equilibrium that is being reached between these two people, because for a long time, genderqueer people and transsexual people were at odds with one another. And that is finally starting to go away, which is beautiful to see, because there's room at the table for everyone. And trans identity allows so much room to maneuver. My favorite thing lately is that there's a, there's a group of two-spirit activists um, that are involved in First Nations work in the US, and what they're seeing is in indigenous Native American communities, they are taking the word two-spirit back to refer to all queer and trans people of First Nations. It is an, it's an opportunity for them to reclaim old language from their own culture. And so the words continue to grow and modify and make room for themselves. We did make one huge mess up, however, <laughs> in an effort to try to be inclusive. And that's with the intersex community. So intersexuality is, again, this is not new, it's just we're finally having this conversation. Intersexuality is it's a genetic condition, right? So people who fall outside of the strict XX and XY genetic designation. What they're finding now is that like potentially intersex people, they used to think that intersex people were like one in like 500,000, now they think it might be more like one in 400, which is a much larger number than we ever considered. But we're understanding intersexuality now better because of, we understand genetics better. The problem with this is that the day that intersexual people were finally part of a visible dialogue in the community, we threw that I into the alphabet suit so quick, it gave ourselves whiplash. The problem is, the majority of people who are advocating for intersexual rights don't want to be included in the alphabet suit. Because for a lot of intersex people, this is not an identity. It is a genetic designation of who they are. They have many, many more identities other than this one. And so this is one of those places, whenever I see the I included, when people are describing their centers and whatnot, I always think to myself, intersex advocates are, have been saying for probably the last 10 years, we appreciate the nod but this really isn't, we're not fighting the same fight. And the intersex community right now is almost solely focused on the non-medical intervention on the bodies of children. This is what they do, leave children's bodies alone. Because if we could do that, we'd be doing great. Um, but instead, you know, every single day, people are intervening on the bodies of children in, in every state, in every country. And I have to say, in some ways, if you look at the data, I mean, intersex people might be better than we are, like genetically. You know, they did a study of high-performing Olympic athletes, like gold and silver medal athletes in all sports fields, and the percentage of intersex people in those fields was higher than in any other discipline. Like, I mean, again, they might just be more evolved than we are. They can run faster, they have better oxygenation in their blood, like real talk, like any minute now, we might be working for these folks, and rightly so, because we can't catch them. <laughs> and so, it's important that we give intersex people their due. It's just, this is a moment for, the, for queer people to sit down and think, okay, solidarity is one thing. Solidarity is important. Solidarity across identities and across platforms and political stances. Should you be supporting Black Lives Matter and the rights of women and the rights of immigrants? Yes, we can do all those things at the same time. But throwing people in and making them a part of who we are without their consent, it's a little it. So, now, are there intersex people who are queer? Yeah. And so, we're happy to make room for them when they want to be with us. Okay, so here's the thing about queer. Um, <laughs> and I'm not even entirely sure where to start. You know, queer has never really lost its original meaning, right? Queer m means strange or different. It means people who won't or can't fit in. And for a really long time, queer was like a, it was a word that was supposed to not necessarily demean us, but definitely make us feel less than fully human. The problem is that a lot of us are queer. I mean, we can't fit in, and we don't want to. I mean, activists in the 1990s started saying queer, especially HIV positive activists were saying queer because they couldn't fit in, because nobody wanted them. When people who were HIV positive came out and said, I have AIDS, I have HIV, and we're doing this work, it made everyone uncomfortable, straight people and gay people. 
people. No one knew what to do. And in the 1980s, an HIV diagnosis was a death sentence. And so if you only had a year to live, you had to fight really the damn well hard to get what you needed. And so using the word queer was a way of taking power back from a group of people and giving it to us. Here's the important thing about queer. Queer functions on multiple levels. For me, as a person who identifies as queer, queer for me is one, a sexual orientation. Because my approach to my sexuality does not fit very well into just one or the other. Gay worked for me until I started having partners who were genderqueer. And then later having partners who identified as female. I don't identify as bisexual because I think that that is a disservice to bi people. Because I am not a bi person. But my queerness allowed me this room to maneuver sexually. For me, queer is also political. So when I walk into a room, there's nothing in the world I like more than being invited to like fancy things. Um, I'm bad at fancy things, by the way. I should never be invited to like cocktail parties and stuff because I say what I mean a lot. But I love to walk into a room with people, fancy people, and say that I'm queer, and then like watch this. What I would consider, if it was a full length film, it would be a two hour process, but like in a moment it only lasts for 30 seconds, while they're trying to figure out what the hell just happened. And they're like, oh wait, what? Oh God, he just said queer. Can I say queer? Oh God. Is, it, is, that, is that what's happening? And I love to watch that happen. And then almost everyone always goes, okay, what does that mean? Great, now we're having a dialogue. Because I am politically queer. For me, I see no particular appealing reason to want to be straight. I mean, I never wanted to be straight. I wanted to be less different <laughs> when I was young. But I never wanted to be straight. And in our world right now, especially with the push for assimilation, there's a lot of talk about this. You, you guys have heard this, right? This whole love is love thing. I mean, that's great on a bumper sticker, but I'm not really sure that like works in reality. I always say love is love until you want to hit someone with a hairbrush with their consent. And then suddenly love is like less love. You're like, ooh, I'm not sure about that. I'm not sure that love makes me comfortable. Queer people are saying to the world that they don't want to be straight, that they're happy being queer, they're happy being on the outside, because the outside includes a lot of really kick-ass people. And so queerness gives us the maneuverability that they want. Also, don't let people tell you that queer is generational. And as many people as turn their nose up at queer, there are so many of our elders who identify as queer people. This is not an age thing. Um, we did a study when I was in Charlotte that allowed people to self-identify, and by far, the two areas that we didn't expect to have queer people in it were people above 65, but above 65, there were a ton of ace people and a ton of queer people. And so we're given this room to maneuver. And reclaiming queer can be so powerful. Because if someone says to you, well, you know what? You won't fit in because you're one of those queer people. And you go, exactly. And they're like, oh, damn, that's all I had. I got nothing else. Great. Enjoy your protest. And so the, the idea of having this power is so important to us. But being strange and different is awesome. I mean, how many of us, I mean, really, truthfully, are we on our way to some kind of all-caps normal? I hope not. I mean, I'm walking around with an archive box tattoo and the, on my arm, and a sexual orientation that makes people scratch their heads. And so, I love that. I mean, that's great. Being queer was like the greatest gift the empty universe ever gave me. Because for me, what it means is that I don't have to act a particular way. Do you guys, I mean, you know, straight people, don't listen for a minute while I talk to queer people. But queer people, do straight people do stuff that you think is weird? Because I feel, I, sometimes I feel like Jane Goodall like I'm at a park, and I've got my, my glasses on, and I'm like, what are they doing? And I'm like taking notes, and I ask straight people later, straight people that I trust. I'm like, what just happened? I'm, I'm going to a wedding next week, y'all. And all the stuff that's happening with this wedding is so confusing to me, and I keep asking, like, I don't understand. What are you, what are you telling me? What is this thing I'm doing Friday? Why am I doing that? And so sometimes being a queer person to me has always allowed me the maneuverability of not having 2,000 years of cultural history that I have to live up to. If I end up having multiple partners, or if I'm poly, or if I'm an, you know, an anarchist, or whatever, I'm allowed to do that because I'm queer. If I go into a room and say I'm an anti-capitalist, people are like, well, I mean, yeah, he's queer. You know? <laughs> and I'm like, yeah, I got to do this, and I didn't have to fight to get here to do it. And to me, that's so powerful. I think, truthfully, like real queer liberation for me is, and we'll go with this, with this next one, Real queer liberation for me has always really been about the opportunity to gather all the data that's possible and then make an informed decision. And so when we're talking about young people 
going through puberty and learning about life and reading books. And the first time someone says, oh, you should read Ayn Rand. And then an older person goes, don't read that garbage. <laughs> read Tales of the City instead. Like the first time that happens to you, I really would like people to have more time to ask the right kinds of questions. Because you gotta kiss a lot of frogs before you find that person, that human that you wanna be with. And I would prefer to have been given more opportunities as a young person to try this out. Instead of what happened, which is living closeted until I was 19 and having to figure it out all by myself. Someone told me just recently, <laughs> and I'm never sure how to take this, that I was the oldest functional queer person they had ever met. <laughs> now granted, I am, you know, I am closer to 50 than I am to 20 at this part of my life. But I, in some ways I was like, oh, that's nice. And the other ways I was like, damn, that sucks. Right, because I want you to have more opportunities to do this. Questioning was added by our friends in the psychological community in the mid-1990s in an effort to get more funding. And so they, they went, this was 1995, a group of psychologists went to the American Psychological Association and said, we think we could do something for gay and lesbian teens. And they were like, oh no, 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 no. There are no such thing as gay teens. You'll never get money for that. It freaks people out, they think you're recruiting. And they said, well, what about questioning? They're like, okay, that we can fund. And so we got the word questioning as a way of spending money on gay people. And what it did was it opened up a whole new world for people. It allows people to ask the right kind of questions. Because your, destiny, you know, your, your journey and your destination are different things. And I would love for us to be able to to have this kind of moment. You know, in all the ways I think that matter in our culture, gay people are always being forced to choose what we think are the best things that straight people do and then to emulate those things, but never in reverse. We're never going to young straight people and going, you know how queer relationships are great and here's why. And maybe you should think about adding some queer relationship things into your relationship. But we don't get the reverse. And I think questioning allows us more of that. It allows us to get somewhere kind of interesting. I don't know why asexuality is so difficult for people. When I see when I see people talking about the AS community, they always have such a they always have such like a puzzled look on their face. Part of it is because the ace community has benefited entirely from trans generations of people organizing in person and online. So when the ace community came out and said, you know what, we gotta get organized, we've got to get ourselves together, they had models. They were they didn't have to do it all by themselves, which is awesome. But what did happen was, from, from the perspective of people not in the community, it was like, straight, straight and gay, straight and gay and lesbian, straight, gay and lesbian and bi, straight, gay and lesbian and bi and trans, and then somehow like the, the door came off and everybody came rushing in at the same time. And people, I love when people say, well you know what, there's just, the language is just too complicated now. And I'm always like, all right Maureen, like just take a breath, like it ain't that complicated, like there's just more of it. But ace people have benefited from this, and honestly, ace people have given all of us an opportunity to think very clearly about what it means to have or have not different kinds of attractions. It's a really, it cannot be about what you're doing, right? Because I'm queer right now, and as far as I know, I haven't had queer sex since I've been up here. So it can't be about what I'm doing all the time. It has to be about who I am. And so ace people have given us the most amazing gift which is to talk about identity outside of activity and talk about identity as a thing that is happening inside of your body and your brain. And so ace people aren't just like sexually neutral humans moving through the universe. They are people who are identifying non-sexual identities, conditional sexual identities, and romantic identities that allow all of us to think more clearly about who, who we are, what we're doing, and how we're attracted. And this is a great, I really do feel like this is a great gift that we've been given. But we're just not quite there yet. The discovery of the Kenzie X's was a huge benefit to the ace community, no question. And I don't think ace identity is complicated, I just think ace identity is what happens when you take a generation that is interested in fluidity, add in unlimited data plans, and an internet, and then this happens. It wasn't a shock or a surprise, it was just the thing that happened when the resources all came. The one thing I would change for ace people is I hate that ace flag. I'm sorry, y'all. I know we all got flags, but that ace flag is so sad. Too much gray. Like, can we throw a strap of blue up in that thing? Every time I see a little ace flag, I'm always like, y'all are better than that sad little flag, y'all. Come on. 
Now, again, I'm a big proponent of the original Gilbert Baker flag, the original nine, but that's me. Side sidebar, it's not really anything we're talking about, but I'm having a sequin jacket made to wear to an opening I'm going to that's gonna have the Gilbert Baker flag in the back and rhinestones, so you're welcome. Because that's gonna be the gayest thing that anyone's seen in the state in a minute. At least it's Fanny Flag Road Crockett Tomatoes. But. And then I think finally, and not finally, um, probably the interesting, to me the most interesting thing to discuss right now is polyamory. And so again, polyamory is not necessarily just a queer function. It's just what, what is happening right now in the world is that relationships are being reevaluated. Why have we been doing a thing? This is no slight to people who are monogamous. Like, I don't make fun of monogamous people. Um, like, live your best life, do the things that make you happy. But what queerness and transness and aceness has done for us is it allowed us to sit and discuss what our actual relationships look like. So, as a queer person who identifies as poly, I have been in many different arrangements with other consenting human beings. My current partner and I are poly, and being in a poly relationship has always felt so safe for me. It makes me feel loved and seen, but it does feel like a challenge. Polyamory is, of all, in, the, in every way that matters, a direct challenge to conversations about marriage equality. Because marriage equality does not make room for polyamory. And so polyamorous people like myself find ourselves at odds with the culture that is obsessed with you know, huge weddings and whatnot. But they're not, they're not, we're not fighting each other, it's just that there's got to be room for everyone in this thing. And if you're queer and you want to have multiple partners with consent, you should be able to do that. And that's what's supposed to happen. But polyamory makes people uncomfortable because non-monogamy requires a lot from us. I will say the greatest thing that ever happened to me as a poly person, shareable Google calendars. Because now I know where I'm supposed to be. Every single day. Because without it in the past, I have shown up at the wrong place, or I've missed a dinner. Nowadays, my phone buzzes this morning. My partner woke me up at 6.30 to tell me that they were sick and I should come home. And I was like, we have other people in this relationship who are closer. Call one of them, because I'm in Florence, giving a talk to these nice people. And so being in a poly relationship is, it is a place of resistance, because traditional relationships don't work for everybody, and they don't have to. And so I think what I would like to end with is we're not done yet. We're not finished. Um, you know, when I was queer at 19, we had gay, lesbian, bi, and trans. That was all we had. And so I chose gay because it made sense. And then as soon as I had other options, I chose them. Now the alphabet soup grows every single day. I think we're up to 15 letters in the soup now, which is great. But um, it's... We're not finished because we're still having conversations. What is great to me is that we're returning in a lot of ways to our queer roots now, and we're having these vocal and open conversations because we have to, because we want to, because the Gen Zers are saying, y'all gotta catch up, we have things to do, and I think that's awesome. And so we are exploring the variety of what it means to be queer through our language as often as possible. And I think if I've done this correctly, there should be a black slide. I love it when I get to the right place at the right time. Um, we have time for questions, yeah? I don't know how this works, I'm sorry. Well, and I know some people um, may have to leave to go to an 11 o'clock class, but we do have a few minutes before our next um, activity, um, which is gonna be a panel discussion that will be in the loft. Um, but if anybody does have some questions for Josh now, he will be back at lunch um, to do our keynote. But we will have a Thanks for having me, y'all. Yeah,